Good afternoon. I'm Becky Hogue, and this is my mom, Betty Moorhead. Who... Yes, and it's great to see everybody that has realized that here we are, ready to start another year. And I've lost track of how many years we've been doing this, but it's a long time. And we're happy to have all of you this year. So enjoy. It's actually our 31st season, as you can see on the program. And I always um, invite people, if you're not on my email list, we're almost 300 in number on the email list now. So I have a clipboard, and if you're new, and would like to get monthly emails about the program, just raise your hand or I'll set it back there um, at the end. You can sign up later and I'll email you once a month about what's coming up or hopefully we don't have any changes, but usually it's just a preview of the coming um, program. I, I just wanted to mention that um, this program was actually from the Decatur Public Library, and my grandmother, Winifred Moorhead, my father's mother, um, was a, one of the founding members of that group in the 50s. And my father, Lee Moorhead, loved the name and decided to start the book group where he, as a Methodist minister, lived all over the Midwest. And I thought we started, he started the program in Green Bay, Wisconsin, but <laughs> I found an old flyer from Carbondale, Illinois, where I, we lived when I graduated from high school. So he actually started it in Carbondale in the, um, it's about, six, uh, about 1971 or so. So I, anyway, it's a well-traveled program, but if you um, are interested, the, uh, the Decatur, Illinois Public Library has a, a web page and they're still doing the program, and hopefully they don't mind that we've been still are still using the name. I think we get a bigger crowd than they. Do. <laughs> so, anyway, welcome, and we'll see you. Um, I think everyone got a program, and can get email, and I'm going to turn it over to George. And we really appreciate our partnership with the library for 15 years. Mm -hmm. There, It'll be the, the library opened uh, 15 and a half years ago. So. so we moved over here from the Methodist Church then, so we couldn't do it without them. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. And, and uh, the library couldn't do it without Betty and Becky, so we really appreciate the collaboration we have. Um, we have uh, on the back counter, uh, for those that maybe didn't get one, we have the Books Between Bites uh, program flyer for this season. Another great season. And, uh, and after 31 years, it's too bad if they don't like us using it because we're not going to stop. <laughs> uh, and then there's also, uh, as, a, as a courtesy to the Depot Museum, there's a flyer about their open house on Saturday, the expansion open house from 1 to 4 on Saturday, and there's a flyer on the back counter for this as well, so please pick that up on your way out. And it's my pleasure to introduce a speaker who is here for her first time, and hopefully not her last, uh, at Book Swing Bites. It's Laura Newman, uh, Batavia City Administrator. Uh, she's been in this position for uh, just over a year now. She uh, uh, came on board after Bill McGrath retired. And uh, she's a graduate of the University of Illinois, Go Illini, and, uh, <laughs> and also... <laughs> ILL. <laughs> I-N-I. Uh, Chicago Kent School of Law is where she uh, received her uh, Juris Doctor, and uh, she was in the corporate world for uh, the past 12 years, and uh, but has lived in Batavia for 14, and the in uh, the Joel McKee House, which most people know better as uh, the Bill and Barbara Hall House. And, uh, That's okay with me. <laughs> yeah. Um, rapidly becoming the Newman House. And, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I moved here 14 years ago and called Batavia home, and we're, we're very glad that uh, she and Steve are here. 
And we are very happy uh, today to have Laura here to talk to us about Profiles in Courage. So Laura, this will be. Thank you very much. Thank you, George, Marilyn, and Becky for um, inviting me here. It's really an honor to um, speak before this group. I have, um, all my life, I've been a lover of books. Um, they've taken me places that I would never have an opportunity to visit. They've allowed me to meet people I otherwise never uh, know. And um, I continue my love of reading. And I especially appreciate opportunities like this that um, provide me a chance to stop and pick up my reading again. Because life can get so busy and uh, you get a few pages into a book and it just gets kind of set aside. but. When you know that on a certain date that you're going to be speaking for about an hour about a certain publication, then why you read it cover to cover very thoroughly. Um, and this is actually my second reading of this book. I read it when I was nine years old. And it was quite a challenge to read this with a nine-year-old's vocabulary and understanding of how things worked in the world, let alone the United States Congress. Um, but I think it's it's really special um, to me that I always made friends with somebody in the library who, who were on the staff and that could get to know me and I'd always ask them to help me pick a book. You know me, help me pick a book. And this was one of those selections that one of those librarians picked for me. And um, the reason why I think it's really special is that uh, I'll give you a little bit of my background. I loved school. You love books, I guess you end up kind of loving school too. Um, and as I was going into college, I sat down with, they called them guidance counselors then. I, I don't know if the name has changed, but they help you um, choose what you know path you're gonna take post high school. And it was suggested to me because I, I, I kind of thought my career would be somewhere in, I thought helping in, between management and, and the employees in a corporation kind of manage that relationship to kind of be the best that it could be. And they said, well, um, you know, and I said, I, I love the law too. And they said, oh, well, if you want to be a lawyer, you should study political science. And so that's the school that I applied to at the University of Illinois was political science. And while I loved the coursework and the, the conversations that we were having in class about government and the, the political issues that were happening during that time three decades ago, um, <laughs> I, I started to think, now, what does one do with a degree in political science? It doesn't seem like it's getting me to that, that place that I saw. As, as my career. So I changed over to the business school and I actually ended up receiving a degree in marketing, of all things. And after I graduated, I was in sales for a while, but it really didn't, it, it wasn't my passion. And so I decided to uh, go to law school and I ended up actually practicing labor and employment law. So I did a lot of um, contract negotiation and um, even in the public sector. And I really, what I most enjoyed about that job was um, before bad things happen, try to be in there to try to build that good relationship so that you don't end up in arbitration. You don't end up in litigation. But there were a lot of arbitrations and, and litigations that happened while I was in, uh, in, in practice. And it just wasn't, uh, I, I still felt not my calling. But there was one of my uh, clients that needed somebody to head up HR. And I thought, you know, that's, that's what I really have a passion for. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that job. And, and honestly, I think that I would have still been working for that company for the rest of my career because I loved my job and I loved the people that I worked with. And it, it's a Japanese company, so I got to learn another culture that I very much loved as well. But then Bill McGrath retired. And I thought, you know, I have always had a passion for uh, government and service to my community. And since moving here 14 years ago, 
I have just fallen in love with the city of Batavia. I tell everybody I, I remember the exact moment that it happened. I was uh, had a new dog, and we were in training together, because obedience training is as much for the owner as for the dog, and um, needed to kind of socialize a little bit. And we walked over to, uh, I heard some commotion up on Wilson Street one Wednesday evening. What could be going on on a Wednesday evening? The homecoming, Gary Shira, our former police chief, knows. <laughs> and um, it was, just a perfect symbol of what this community is because it wasn't just the high schoolers and their family and their friends it was the whole community out there little kids with the high school football players jersey numbers on cheering for them and uh so i said to myself if the city administrator ever retires <laughs> and I had to wait 10 more years. <laughs> but uh, that is what prompted me to um, take the position that I have now, and um, I'm so pleased. I love my job every single day. Um, because of it, I've had the opportunity to meet a number of you who are sitting here today, and that's been a pleasure as well. Um, but when I was asked to uh, do uh, Books Between Bites, um, I thought I'd like to do this about profiles and courage because the book was really an inspiration to me. I guess it didn't uh, set my path on the, the same trajectory as the, the people that we'll talk about uh, who are profiled in the book, um, but it led me back there to government. And I think one of the major themes in the book is doing your best and being your best, even if it isn't the popular thing to do, and to be guided um, by your conscience. And I think it's a, an excellent um, lesson for people of any age um, to be civic-minded, no matter what your role is, we are all citizens of the United States, and we have the uh, right and the honor of being able to vote and select who will be our leaders. And we grant them a tremendous amount of power to shape what all of our futures will be and what the future will be for our children and our grandchildren. So with that, um, give a little background. By uh, raising hands, how many have read Profiles in Courage? So, now, did you read it recently? Who read it recently? And who read it years ago? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but I recently, I guess I'm both, right? Because I did have in depth reread it for uh, exactly this purpose. And it was a pleasure to think about um, the impressions that I had as a nine year old of this book and the impressions that I now have <clears throat> four decades later. <laughs> but um, so for some background, um, the book was first published in 1955. Um, John F. Kennedy wrote this book in 1954 while he was recovering from a back surgery. And uh, he won the Pulitzer Prize for Biography in 1957 for this book. Um, at the time that he wrote it, he was a very junior um, senator from Massachusetts. And um, I think among the important things about his background in discussing this book, um, you know, he was the second to eldest son of the Kennedy family. It was uh, Joseph Jr. who was uh, his father's, um, let's say, pick to go on to do great things for the United States. Um, and unfortunately, his older brother, Joseph, was killed in World War II. And John also served in World War II. And among the you know, most famous stories about John F. Kennedy is how he saved his crew on PT-109. Um, and so that certainly was a brand of courage 
so I find it very interesting that in this book, he talks about a different kind of courage, and that's uh, political courage. So the premise of the book is that it's a study of political courage, and it's exemplified in eight different biographies of senators who voted consistent with their conscience, even though their uh, position on a particular issue was opposed by their constituents, by their party, or in some cases, both. And they did so often at a great cost to them personally and professionally. Now, what I find interesting about the particular uh, senators that he chose is that he seemed to choose them for having made an incredibly difficult decision. He didn't choose them because they either had the highest character of any senator who has ever served. He didn't pick them because they were right in the decisions that they made because certainly in a couple of cases, history proved that perhaps that wasn't the best decision to make. But I think that he chose them because they had the most difficult decisions to uh, make to follow their conscience instead of what was popular or what would get them reelected. So one of the questions that arose to me now in my life as opposed to when I was nine was, why did Kennedy choose to write this book? We know that he was a historian. Um, his, his other book was on uh, British history. Uh, so we know that he liked to study history. I'm sure that was one of the motivating factors. Um, but it also seemed to me, both in uh, the preface of the book and its conclusion, both not biography portions of the book, that he had future aspirations. You can kind of see that in uh, his writing, warning of this uh, foreign enemy that is on the horizon. And you know, the book being written uh, shortly after World War II, at the end of World War II, Russia taking over territories that they helped to liberate from uh, Nazi control, whereas we did not really do the same. Um, he, he could see that the Cold War was escalating at that point. And so I do think that it was um, sort of a, a call or an inspiration to people to be aware that that was a looming danger. I do think part of it was aspirations for higher office as well. And it would not be unique in doing that. Um, in a portion of the book that uh, I'll, I'll read the quotation from it, he notes that at the time of the biographies, um, when those gentlemen served in office, um, information did not travel as fast as current times, and by current times, I mean 1955. And he's talking about how the influence of the way that um, facts travel. Imagine today, I mean, it's just, it's just exploded, so it's even more so. So I do think that it was uh, a way for him to communicate to anyone um, reading that book elements of his character that he felt would be important in their decision whether they would choose him to be president or not. Um, but I also think that perhaps it was a study because he was early in his career as senator that he was exploring um, how others have approached the situation where what they felt about an issue in their conscience did not comport with what would be popular either with their constituents or with their party. And uh, in so doing, um, if he faced that in his future senatorial career, he could rely upon how those gentlemen approached that. And, uh, but I was wondering, 
because I like it to be a conversation. Does anybody else have other thoughts about why Kennedy may have chosen to write this book and at this time? Well, if it comes to you, we can talk about it later, because, oh, yes? Uh, well, uh, I'm thinking of him recovering from back surgery and having a lot of time and introspect in the, in the war and soldiers and, and uh, regarded as a hero for doing that. And, um, you know, maybe he started thinking, well, who are my heroes? Or, what would be heroic to me, something like that. That is, that's great, heroic examples for him to emulate. Yes? I think it's also possible that he may have been thinking forward to his own political career, and this would be helpful to his career. Absolutely. I totally agree. Yes, Dan? There's no question that that was on his mind, because as the junior senator, he was way behind Henry Cabot Lodge, who eventually would be on the opposition ticket in 1960. So to be taken seriously as a candidate, he had to put forth his both findings, if you will, to say, I am a serious candidate and I want to be taken seriously. Because he had that reputation of being playboy. Of course, just a year before that, when he'd been hurt, he had married Jackie, you know, this, this beautiful debutante. So, he was not seen politically as a serious candidate. I, I truly believe the comments that are being made about that are, are accurate. And, and his youth. Yeah. You know, he was only 40 years old when he took office and 51 when he left office. I th around those ages, but, you know, uh, like you say, being a junior senator, youth, having that reputation, a book like this, this this is weighty stuff. I think this is, is will speak to many generations. Yes? Well, I was just going to say that perhaps he was also wondering, as many of our elected officials are doing today, um, do you go with your party or do you go for your country? Exactly. What's best for the country? And that's the message I got. From reading it, and I could not help but think about those men then, and the men we have today in office, and the strife goes on. Do we go for the party or do we go for the country? Exactly. And I can see that it's been solved, but yeah. we had a good start. Yeah. If I haven't mentioned it, today's politics also drove my choice to have this be our book to be discussed today, and I was wondering if it could be assigned reading for Congress. <laughs> Maybe for any elected official. In fact, I, I would love it if it was something that at some point in the curriculum, um, before you graduate high school, that this was a book that was read, because I think that civics are important. Anybody else? Well, a lot of what uh, Kathy was just saying is uh, that was in his inaugural address. Yes. That's not what, you, what your country can do for you, that's what you can do for your country. That's right. All good thoughts, thank you. There was a little bit of controversy surrounding this book, and it was whether John F. Kennedy actually wrote this book or was it written by his speechwriter, Ted Sorensen? And some of the most serious allegations regarding that were leveled by Mike Wallace, who would go on to make a lot of uh, controversial allegations uh, in his career, but was a very esteemed journalist, even by myself. I count myself among the longest watchers of 60 minutes ever. <laughs> I came to meet the press a little late, but I am a stalwart um, 60 minutes watcher. Um, JFK, of course, vehemently denied that Ted Sorensen wrote the book for him. Um, however, as time has passed, historians lean more toward 
believing that Ted Sorensen wrote the book, although they believe that uh, JFK himself did the in-depth research and provided the notes on which those biographies were written. They also say that they can hear Kennedy's voice in both the uh, first chapter and those last two chapters of the book, which talk about courage in, in politics. Um, so knowing this fact doesn't detract for me, um, any any of the reasons why I love and admire this book, but for some it may. Um, but there's so I thought that was an interesting fact that before I did the research for this presentation, I didn't know of that controversy. Did anyone else know of that controversy? Yeah. So interesting. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, profiles. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, it's as interesting to learn about the gentlemen who are profiled as it is to learn about what was going on in US history at the time that those uh, decisions were made. And so uh, just the first section is dealing with um, uh, the right after the revolution is the first guy, but the next um, three have to do with lead up to the Civil War and um, the efforts of um, the particular gentlemen to do what they thought would preserve the Union. And in some cases, decisions that we might find abhorrent today. But, um, you know, at, at the time, like I said, uh, sometimes history proved these gentlemen right, and sometimes history proved these gentlemen wrong. So the first individual that JFK profiled was John Quincy Adams, um, son of President Adams, but eventually became sixth. I guess we, we call 45 now, but six sounds, you know, so much loftier. Um, it's kind of interesting that JFK describes John Quincy Adams in this book as an upstart. And I guess I would, that's where I wanted to point out that he's not necessarily um, rewarding them or lauding them because of their character or their personality, but merely an examination of them being dedicated to vote with their conscience. Uh, John Quincy Adams, of course, senator from Massachusetts and he voted in favor of the Louisiana Purchase, the main industrial area of the United States at this time, of course, is New England. That's the economic powerhouse. And the people in Massachusetts and his party were very angry with him for voting in favor of the Louisiana Purchase because it would bring economic, it would draw the economic investment away from New England. Um, the constituents were so angry with him over this vote that um, he resigned one year later. But of course, that was not the end of his political aspirations, and eventually he came, he made it to be, uh, he was elected president. The second individual is Daniel Webster, and uh, Daniel Webster was also a senator from Massachusetts. And Massachusetts um, was very abolitionist. Um, and he is famous for his 7th of March speech, um, which was in favor of Henry Clay's compromise bill in order to preserve the Union. So he's really voting contrary to um, the conscience of his constituents. But in his heart, he felt that preservation of the Union was more important than whether new states joining the Union had the right to choose whether to be slave states or not. Um, this is an area where, from morality, the decision made seems is abhorrent, but 
It delayed the start of the Civil War by 10 years and reduced the number of issues over which the Civil War was fought. History says millions of lives were saved, but in, at the same time, um, a, slavery should never be and under a constitution that grants liberty to all. And um, those, the later biographies are about um, holding up the, the values of our constitution versus what would be politically easy to do. Next is uh, Thomas Hart Benton. And he took an uncompromising stand that new territories should be allowed to decide the slavery issue for themselves. Uh, I'm sorry, against that, even though he himself is from Missouri, he himself is a slave owner. But it's at this point where he realizes that the South will seek to gain power by um, convincing the newer states to uh, be slave states and thus increase their power in what is an imminent, at this point, civil war. The next is uh, a man who is famous for so many reasons, um, being the uh, a war hero at San Jacinto, for being governor of Texas, um, but he took a very unpopular stance in Texas, a southern state, when he refused to support the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which was repealing the Missouri Compromise. But Sam Houston's um, persona was so electric and charismatic and strong that even a decision where uh, he was very much uh, castigated for that, he still fought back to become the governor of Texas. When an interesting thing happens, the state legislature votes to side with the South. In the Civil War, they vote to secede with the Southern states. So while he was elected governor, he refused the oath of office on that issue, still standing with his prior views on slavery. And then we have Edmund G. Ross. Um, the radical Republicans were uh, that branch of the Republicans that really sought to punish the South for the Civil War. Um, they were the, op the opposite of the Reconstructionists. And um, the radical Republicans tried to block Andrew Johnson from firing his uh, Secretary of War, who, uh, ooh, name escapes me right now, yeah. Stanton. Um, they tried to block him from firing um, Stanton be and um, on the grounds that the Senate should have the, a review of that. It wasn't a presidential power. But Edmund Ross voted against his party um, because he believed, again, upholding one of these uh, values in our Constitution and the separation of powers, that it wouldn't be right for Congress to be able to um, tell a president that they had to keep someone in their cabinet who they felt did not um, support their presidency, and in this case, the reason being, he wanted to fire the Secretary of War because the Secretary of War was um, one of the radical Republicans, and um, uh, the president was more of a Reconstructionist. And then we have a man with an incredibly long name. <laughs> I wonder if anybody ever, because it would take forever, you know, when you get to his name in the list, you, and uh, Mr. Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus Lamar. <laughs> I have to believe they just called him Lucy, maybe. <laughs> no. Um, so he was from Mississippi, and Mississippi after the Civil War was just in shambles. 
and um, he, uh, Lucius Lamar voted against free silver. Up to this point, the U.S. had been operating on the gold standard for currency, but as Western progression happened, they found this new metal in the ground, silver, and the silver started becoming a an, uh, another currency to be used, and gold was the standard of the northeastern banks. And so um, they, uh, Congress was voting on whether or not to allow the southern states to pay off their debts to the northern banks that were the result of the Civil War using this free silver. And because he believed it to be an uh, informal currency, he felt that the U.S. should just beyond that gold standard, um, he voted against what would have more easily gotten Mississippi out of their financial crisis. Again, this is one of those decisions that JFK points to as probably not the right decision because it really did hold the South back from um, being able to recover as quickly as they might have had they agreed that they could pay their debts off with the free silver. And then we have George Norris, who uh, opposed the uh, Speaker of the House, although they were of the same party. He was known as Joe the Czar Cannon. <laughs> and um, he, the, the rule at the time was that the Speaker had the ability to appoint all of the members of committees and who the chairman of those committees would be. And this young senator felt like that was too much power in one person. And so he introduced a bill, and actually the, the legislation was adopted to take that power away from the speaker. There was another very unpopular vote that George Norris made, and that was that he was opposing authorizing the uh, President Wilson in 1917 to arm US merchant ships, which were being attacked by the Germans as they crossed the Atlantic, but what George Norris saw this was a way for private companies to prompt the U.S. involvement in World War I, and he felt that was not the right reason to arm these merchant ships, and um, he himself was uh, very much opposed to U.S. involvement in the war. Eventually, Woodrow Wilson, he wanted the approval of Congress, but he determined that he had the right by executive order to arm those ships. And so he offered to resign uh, George Norris because it was such an unpopular vote at home. He offered to the governor that he would resign, but because he felt so strongly about his position and it had to do with whether this country was going to go to war or not, he took time to travel the state and city by city, he would give these speeches to explain to people why he voted the way that he did. And eventually, he did such a phenomenal job of convincing them that it was a closer call than really they thought it was, and, and some ended up changing their minds about it, that the governor said that he would not accept his resignation and there would be no special election. And then finally, we have Robert Taft, who probably his decision cost him his party's nomination. But it's an incredible issue. I can only imagine the struggle of conscience that this man went through. We have a US Constitution that says you cannot be punished for something that was not a crime when you committed it. Otherwise, if the government wanted to take away your liberty, they would just pick something that you had done in the past, make it a crime, and put you in jail. In the Nuremberg trials, the atrocities committed by the gentlemen who were on trial are horrific. But at the time that they did them, there was no law prohibiting those actions. And so, Robert Taft took the extremely unpopular position of saying that the, there sh because it violates a provision of the United States Constitution, which does not apply 
in an international for forum. But these are the principles that as an American, we live by. And so he uh, strongly opposed the Nuremberg trials and, and was, it definitely cost him his party's nomination in the next election. So what is the importance of this book? I talked about it a little bit at the beginning. It's an in-depth examination of what courage means in the political context. And it's very interesting to me because in my job, I get to see that every Tuesday night and the first and third Mondays. <laughs> because I, I see elected officials make those kinds of decisions and they're no less weighty because they affect the people who live right next door to them, everybody in Batavia, and the future of our city. And I also like, and I mentioned before, that each chapter teaches the reader about a critical point um, in American history. Um, I have a few quotes that I wanted to share from the book that I found especially poignant. First, I'll hold the book right side up. <laughs> I always tell people I'm very good at reading things upside down, though, because I did contract negotiations. <laughs> um, the first is from the, and it's no surprise that but my, some of my favorite quotes are those from the first and the last chapters, but um, today the challenge of political courage looms larger than every, ever before. For our everyday life is becoming so saturated with the tremendous power of mass communications that any unpopular or unorthodox course arouses a storm of protesters such as John Quincy Adams under attack in 1807 could never have envisioned. Our political life is becoming so expensive, so mechanized, and so dominated by professional politicians and public relations men that the idealist who dreams of independent statements, the statesmanship is rudely awakened by the necessities of election and accomplishment. And our public life is becoming so increasingly centered upon that seemingly unending war to which we have given the curious epithet cold, that we tend to encourage rigid ideological unity and, un and orthodox patterns of thought. And thus, in the days ahead, only the very courageous will be able to take the hard and unpopular decisions necessary for our survival in the struggle with a powerful enemy. An enemy with leaders who need give little thought to the popularity of their course who need pay little tribute to the public opinion they themselves manipulate, and who may force, without fear of retaliation at the polls, their citizens to sacrifice present laughter for future glory. And only the very courageous mm. will be able to keep alive the spirit of individualism and dissent which gave birth to this nation, nourished it as an infant, and carried it through its severest tests upon the attainment of its maturity. That first quote, I think so much of it is as true today as it was back then. So in the last chapter, one of the things he says is, this is not to say that courageous politicians and the principles for which they speak are always right. John Quincy Adams, it is said, should have realized that the embargo would ruin New England but hardly irritate the British. Daniel Webster, according to his critics, fruitlessly appeased the slavery forces. Thomas Hart Benson was an unyielding and pompous egocentric. Sam Houston was cunning, changeable, and unreliable. Edmund Ross, in the eyes of some, voted to uphold a man who had defied the Constitution and defied the Congress. Lucius Lamar failed to understand why the evils of planned inflation are sometimes preferable to the tragedies of uncontrolled depression. Norris and Taft, it is argued, were motivated more by blind isolationism than constitutional principles. All of this has been said and more. 
each of us can decide for himself the merits of the courses for which these men fought. But is it necessary to decide this question in order to admire their courage? Must men consciously risk their careers only for principles which hindsight declares to be correct in order for posterity to honor them for their valor? I think not. Surely in the United States of America, where brother once fought against brother, we did not judge a man's bravery under fire by examining the banner under which he fought. Now that particular passage I found perhaps controversial um, because it, you know, I, and right now we're having various cities take down the statues to men who fought the Civil War because it was a nation who was fighting to, uh, the, the, on the South were fighting in, for slavery, right? And um, so I, I found this passage gave me pause. And I wanted to, to ask what all of you feel about that. I mean, I guess what he's saying there is that it's, we can admire someone's courage without attaching it to their decision as to whether we see it as a correct decision or a wrong decision. Does anybody else have some thoughts about this? Would you read the passage again? Sure thing. It's not necessary to decide the question of whether it's right or wrong. In order to admire their courage, must men consciously risk their careers only for principles which hindsight declares to be correct in order for posterity to honor them for their val valor? I think not. Surely in the United States of America, where brother once fought against brother, we did not judge a man's bravery under fire by examining the banner under which he fought. Right? It's thought provoking. Yes? It is, and I, and I think we can admire someone's courage even if we don't believe they did the right thing. Mm -hmm. That it took a lot of courage to do what they did, even though I wouldn't have made that decision myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's, that's certainly very possible. Mm -hmm. Yes? I look at it when I think about religion, you know, as so much as politics. Mm -hmm. Because you can admire somebody who truly believes in a different God than you. Mm -hmm. Admire them for having their faith. Right. Yes. I think say, kind of basically the same as he did, and it's how now you look back and you say, why did they destroy this, that, and the other you know, things when they found the rubble of some of these things? Do you think, what is, I grew grandchildren would have think of the same as we think of the destruction of the Acropolis, the destruction of this and that, you know? And so many beautiful works of art in Rome and stuff like that that were destroyed because of changes of faith. But, you know, and then two calls, we don't it apply in the world, but they're not the person, you know, called it out. Right. And it was what was there at the time, exactly as it was said. You know, this, you can't do it on their hindsight. It's what they did to engage with it. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think at least in a few instances of us people who were wrong, off the hook. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, the, in the instance that you're mentioning about money, I'm yeah. looking at the motive of why those statues were put there. We don't have as much in the north of our road, uh, or you know, the civil rights road. Um, and I have come to believe that their motive was to intimidate the Afro-Americans that they were bound and determined to keep their slaves. So that's just, my, I, I know, uh, it, it would appear most people don't see it that way, but that's the way I see it. I think if you look at the timing of when the statues were erected, it uh, bears your it, it, it really upholds what you're saying. Yeah. Especially in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. Uh, the men who fought the Civil War had a goal and were not agreeing with that at this time. 
some of us. <laughs> I still consider them heroes, but uh, it might be compared to uh, Taft's feelings of Nuremberg, that at that time that was going on, mm -hmm. um, yeah. they felt like they were doing the right thing. Exactly. And we're, you know, so how are we ever to decide? There's always going to be pros and cons about both uh, events. Exactly. Yeah. Anyone else have thoughts to share on that? Okay. I've got um, mm -hmm. I think I'm just going to hit this last one here. Um, yes. These problems do not even concern politics alone, for the same basic choice of courage or compliance continually faces us all. Whether we fear the anger of constituents, friends, a board of directors, or our union, whether whenever we stand against the flow of opinion on strongly contested issues, for without belittling the courage with which men have died, we should not forget those acts of courage which men, such as the subjects of these, this book, have lived. The courage of life is often a less dramatic spectacle than the courage of a final moment, but it is no less a magnificent mixture of triumph and tragedy. A man does what he must in spite of personal consequences, in spite of obstacles and dangers and pressures, and that is the basis of all human morality. To be courageous, these stories make clear, requires no exceptional qualifications, no magic formula, no special combination of time, place, and circumstance. It is an opportunity that sooner or later is presented to us all. Politics merely furnishes one arena which imposes special tests of courage. In whatever arena of life one may meet the challenge of courage, whatever may be the sacrifices he faces, if he follows his conscience, the loss of his friends, his fortune, his contentment, or even the esteem of his fellow men, each must decide for himself the course he will follow. The stories of past courage can define that ingredient. They can teach, they can offer hope, and they can provide inspiration. But they cannot supply courage itself. For this, each man must look into his own soul. And that's how he ends the book. And it's that passage there that I felt listening to John F. Kennedy speak. That sounded like John F. Kennedy to me. That um, greatness lies within each one of us. And um, we all have the ability to uh, show courage and to do the right thing. Um, let's see what else I have here. Quotes. I think I, I'll skip. I've mentioned why this book is so um, special to me, but um, every year uh, a, a Carolyn Kennedy gives an award to someone who has demonstrated the principles in this book. And the 2017 recipients of the Profiles and Courage Award um, in 2017, in March of this year, was uh, former President Barack Obama. And so I'd like to just play the last three minutes um, of his speech. So everyone, every citizen inspired by that history, who dips their toes in the water of active democracy for the first time and musters up the determination to try and fail and try again and sometimes fail again and still try again knowing their efforts aren't always rewarded right away because they believe in that upward trajectory of the American story the story that nobody told better than 
John F. Kennedy. That very Kennedy-esque idea that America is not the project of any one person and that each of us can make a difference and all of us ought to try. That quiet, sturdy citizenship that I see all across the country and that I especially see in young people like Jack and Rose and Tatiana, Kelly and Sasha and your kids. I don't know whether President Kennedy's aide and friend, the historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr., was right when he wrote that history unfolds in cycles. But I do know that it doesn't move in a straight line. I know that the values and the progress that we cherish are not inevitable, that they are fragile in need of constant renewal. I've said before that I believe what Dr. King said, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But I've also said it does not bend on its own. It, it bends because we bend it. Because we put our hand on that arc and we move it in the direction of justice and freedom and equality and kindness and generosity. It doesn't happen on its own. And so we are constantly having to make a choice because progress is fragile. And it's precisely that, that fragility, that impermanence, that is a precondition of the quality of character that we celebrate tonight. If the vitality of our democracy, if the gains of our long journey to freedom were assured, none of us would ever have to be courageous. None of us would ever have to risk anything to protect them. But it's in its very precariousness that courage becomes possible and absolutely necessary. John F. Kennedy knew that our best hope and our most powerful answer to our doubts and to our fears lies inside each of us in our willingness to joyfully embrace our responsibility as citizens, to stay true to our allegiance to our highest and best ideals to maintain our regard and concern for the poor and the aging and the marginalized, to put our personal or party interests aside when duty to our country calls, or when conscious demands. That's the spirit that has brought America so far. And that's the spirit that will always carry us to better days. And I take this honor that you have bestowed on me here tonight as a reminder that even out of office, I must do all that I can to advance the spirit of service that John F. Kennedy represents. Thank you all very much. May God bless you. May he bless these United States of America. Thank you. I couldn't have said it any better. Um, here. Um, I really thank all of you for um, taking the time out of your day to come here and talk about my favorite book with me. And I hope that um, you enjoyed the conversation and I'll really look forward to sitting on that side of the podium next time. <laughs> um, may I ask, does anybody have any questions or comments? Yes, uh, do you link Kennedy's um, obvious um, um, regard for independence and, and showing profile to some of his own actions? Now, he wasn't always right. The Bay of Pigs was awful love. Even the early part of the Korea, uh, Vietnamese conflict was, but in in the in the um, Cuban men, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, he um, he totally disregarded all of the military advisors and most of his own cabinet, and and pursued a totally separate course 
that could have been a catastrophic result against him. It, it, it worked well, but uh, it, it appears. But I just wondered if you linked the things in the book with, with some of his later action. Absolutely. I think he was studying um, that the, being courageous enough to act independently when you truly believe in your heart that where, where you're going is the right course of action, no matter what anyone else thinks of it. And he ended a crisis that could have been literally nuclear without a shot fired. Any other? Yes, sir. Thinking about courage, I am reminded of a book called Walking with the Wind. Yes. If anyone wants to know what courage is, they should read that book of 503 pages. It was written by Congressman John Robert Lewis, who walked with the wind and courage during the Civil Rights Movement. Excellent. Walking with the wind? Yes. Excellent. Any other comments? Laura, yes. there are a lot of impressive things this hour. One of them being that you read this book when you were nine. <laughs> <laughs> I loved books. I would actually um, lay, my mom would be like, it's lights out, Laura. And I'd put down my book and then she'd go down the hallway and I'd position the book so I could catch the light from the hallway. <laughs> If I was smart, I would have got that flashlight and put it under the bedspread. I saw that later in a movie. I was like, brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dan? When I looked at the story of Edmund Ross, the senator from Kansas, who ended up only serving one term as a result of his book, it, it brings to mind how important that decision was because it would have triggered a constitutional crisis because at the time Johnson was president, there was no city vice, vice president. president. There was no mechanism to put back into office somebody. And of course, Johnson probably would not have nominated somebody because of his actions right. in office. Um, and there was the Speaker of the House, who I guess wasn't clearly delineated uh, in my reading. It's been said that um, Benjamin Wade, who was senator from Ohio, I believe, who was president of the Senate, mm -hmm. president pro temporary, would have become president of the United States. So linking my comment about Edmund Ross and that constitutional crisis, uh, you know, 100 years later when President Kennedy is assassinated, once again it triggered in some ways the, uh, not a constitutional crisis, but it did because they finally had to figure out what is the exact delineation of the succession to the presidency on the event of the death of the president. That's interesting. It, it, there really is a connection yeah. between those two. So yeah, very what, insightful. The 25th Amendment? The I don't 25th remember. The 25th Amendment or the 26th? 25th. Anyone else? Well, thanks, everybody. I had so much fun today. Thank you.